Hi there, and welcome to Saving Ophelia and the lovely Danish summer weather. As the phrase for much used Danish song goes, rain showers have come and go, that is the Danish summer. I'll refrain from using my singing voice though, I wouldn't want to hurt your ears. Anyways, my name is Thijs and this, well this is Ophelia. In the episode I uploaded last week, 39B I think, we had Ophelia hauled out and cleaned in order to prepare to fix a minor issue with a hauler, hole about this size. This week we're going to have a look at how we fixed that issue. So we're now back in the workshop because it turned out that the hole in the boat has actually had quite clean edges, there was no corrosion or anything, a bit surprising really. But that means that it makes no sense to cut out an even bigger piece to then well, close the hole up again. Instead we're going to pluck the existing hole the way it is, and for that we need a plug. And there's a bit of a surprise, the metal in the boat is actually quite a lot thinner than I thought it would be. I thought it would be six millimeters, but it turns out that in that spot it's four. And the plate I bought here is eight millimeters, but in this case that turns out to our advantage. We're going to make a plug that's a bit wider than the hole actually is, and then we're going to have 45 degrees chamfers on these on the edges, and that means that the one end is going to be smaller than the hole, the other one is going to be bigger, and well, then we just mash it in place and weld it. And to make that plug, we have this setup. We use this as a guide because we don't want the drill at the center that you'd normally guide this with, because well, then we'd have a hole in the plate and we don't want that so we've made this as a guide and well a piece of wood to absorb when we go through so we don't damage this and this should actually do it and then we just drill and use a bit of water to cool the cut with So the first step to plugging the pit lock hole was obviously to make a permanent plug. So I set to work with the bimetal tipped hole saw twice as you can see. Because of course the first time was with this hole saw. I noticed the diameter of the saw and thought to myself, well that will do the trick. It's just a tad bigger than the hole we need to close, so great. Yeah, except that this is the outside diameter and the saw takes up some space. That of course meant that the disc it cut was 6mm smaller than the outer diameter and thus too small. So I granted myself a do over and went at it again. With the disc cut out, albeit with a hole saw that was too big this time, the rest of the workshop work would be at the grinder. The first pass was to remove any burrs, just to protect my delicate office fingers if nothing else. And yeah, those sparks were hot. It's definitely not just me being a wimp. This, by the way, is absolutely not the solution to the spark issue. As the engineer pointed out, those gloves, specifically the right hand one, risk getting caught in the grind wheel and that would spell trouble. That is, it would if the grinder was bigger than the one I have, of course. This one would probably just get jammed and stop. It would absolutely still hurt like a bitch though. Anyways, what I'm doing here is reducing the diameter of the disc down to the needed diameter, which is marked on the disc with Sharpie. While the curvature of the wheel will make the disc slightly, well, pointy-like, it's not going to be pointy enough, so we'll need to take another pass to reduce the smaller diameter further, once the large one has been brought down close to the diameter of the pit lock hole but not so close that it can be forced through the hole. Grinding away at the metal like that makes it quite warm due to the friction, which is also what makes grinding work, so there's really no way around that. And while the grinder works better, the hotter the metal is, or so I'm told. Again, even with the gloves, there are quite firm limits to how warm the piece can get before I can't handle it. So, in order to, once again, protect my delicate fingers, I was told by the engineer to cool the piece with water against the wire. I hadn't really thought about that, the grinder being electric and so, but obviously it works, and as a bonus, 
I didn't need the glove as long as my fingers were wet. Of course I forgot to record my work after this revelation, so instead of showing you the good example, I'll show you a bit of the process of turning the plug conical. As you might be able to make out, I angle the tool rest at approximately 45 degrees and then just continue grinding as before. And with only a slight touch of editing magic, deployed for you to avoid hours of mind-numbing grinding, here's the result of removing all that steel in very small pieces. In my opinion, it looks quite nice, but the real test, of course, is with the hole it's supposed to plug. The plug fits nicely, so all we need to do now is weld it in place, right? Well, yeah, but maybe we should discuss welding a bit before we get started on that. I probably should be recording this segment here from Ophelia, but there's currently nowhere to sit, so my editing corner will have to do. Actually, this is the episode you're watching right now, minus the segment I'm just about to record, of course. Welding on the surface of it is a quite simple process, right? You melt two pieces of material and maybe add some filler and then they're joined when they, well, bond to one another on a molecular level, right? Well, yes and no, mostly no. Like all crafts, this has a simple concept, but in practice it's a lot more difficult. It's not wrong that you melt the materials and make them join like that. But there are a lot of nuances to it. Well, as far as I know, I'm no welder, I'm just starting to learn. Anyways, you, you can always rely on heat to melt materials. And we can deliver this heat in several different ways when we want to weld things. We can use frictions where things basically rub so hard against one another that they get hot and melt. If we work with plastics or very soft ductile metals, we can use ultrasound to deliver the energy and the new shot is laser welding. It seems very fancy. I've heard there are a few issues with it though, but you basically just have a laser, pound the material with heat and then it melts and joins. The old fashioned way though, and the way Ophelia was probably built, was gas welding. You have an oxyacetylene torch. It's a very, very hot and very narrow flame. And you melt the material and well, then you join just like I said. Except, of course, that you have to fight gravity because molten metal tends to run downwards, which isn't exactly optimal. You want it to stay where it is. So it has to get rid of that heat quite fast and solidify where it is. And Ophelia seems to have been gas welded because the uh, welds on Ophelia are quite different from what we see when we look at electro welded stuff and gas welding is hard. You have to have this very intense narrow flame. If it's too wide, the heat will just dissipate throughout the metal and the bulk of the material. So you have to be very proficient at what you're doing if you want to gas weld, which might explain why Ophelia was rebuilt after she burned out in 69. She was very, very expensive to build in 53 when she was built. Anyways, I'm not going to gas weld. That's definitely beyond my reach. Well, for now at least. At some point, I might try my hand at it, but not going anywhere near that now. What I'm going to do is electro weld her. That means we just pass a quite intense current through the hull and the piece of material that we want to weld in place. And the electrons passing through the material deposit a lot of heat in the contact surface, which melts the material and, well, and voila, there we go, the pieces are joined. But again, there are a few nuances to it. In the simplest case of welding, we might be lucky enough to have two pieces of material that are very smooth edged and fit together very nicely. In that case, well, we'll just heat up the seam here. And any of the welding methods should be able to do that. That will cause the sheet to melt down here and bond. And for the ones, the electro welding ones that don't produce a lot of heat without depositing material, well, if you deposit a bead along here, you will have the same effect as if you just heat the material. If you deposit molten steel on top of steel, well, you'll have a melt zone that can go quite far down. But this, of course, will only work for 
fairly thin material because the bulk around here will absorb and distribute a lot of the heat very, very quickly. So we might have the next case here. Whoops, like that. Well, we have a fairly thick piece. Now, we could obviously start welding here and get a melt zone. And if we have too thick a piece of material for the heat to go all the way through and melt all the way, well, we could melt here. And in some cases, that might be good enough. We'll just get a melt zone that goes all the way through. But in other cases, we might have a zone in here that isn't really welded. And that is obviously a recipe for disaster. You can have a crack like that can start propagating quite easily. And if we have any access to moisture or oxygen, you get corrosion that starts inside the material, which would be a bit of a disaster, at least in a boat. Well, a lot of places, really. So what we do about that is that we... Oh, well, I have to reveal all of it here. Anyways, we cut out... We chamfer both edges and then we fill this up with welding material. We deposit a massive bead here, well, probably several if this is very, very thick. Um, Project Brute Pack, another channel, shows this quite a lot how he does it. And, well, if we can't access both sides, we're going to have a very deep groove where the sheets just meet down here. But otherwise, you would Go at it from both sides and fill both of them up with material, like this. And, well, the material you add, the filler, will bond with both sheets. And, well, that's basically it. Now, this case down here, this is what we have with Ophelia. I'm not sure whether or not the um, material of Ophelia is too thick for what we're doing up here. And it's definitely not thick enough to do this probably. So what we are going to do is to make this conical plug, insert it into the hole, and then start building up the welding material inside here. And yeah, we're going to end with a bead that goes like this up there. And then we of course get penetration both into the plug and into the steel sheet. Well, yeah, the steel hull. And the same on the other side. And once we've done that, then we're going to place a bead here on the outside. Well, down here really, but it will flow and melt this very thin edge and that will melt. And yeah, it's round, so it's going to happen all the way around here. Now, this is quite a good thing for Ophelia because if it turns out that the weld we make is not quite waterproof, quite strong enough, it won't break free and push the entire new piece into the boat from water pressure. It's only about a meter down, so 0.1 atmosphere added to the atmospheric level. But still, there is pressure, as we could see when I had it open and a lot of water came flooding in. Here, at the worst, what we're going to get if the welds break is seepage. Then we'll start to see water seeping through. The plug is too wide to go in. The welding material might break, might slip from this side or this side, but it'll still keep the plug centered. It can't turn in any way that will make it go into the boat. So this is what we're going to do because it minimizes the risk of potential trouble later. Now, this piece out here isn't too pretty. And when Ophelia is going to be sandblasted at some point, I'll probably have them level this off but we're not going to do that now because when we do that, then we'll have someone very proficient at welding to look at the plug and see if that is going to, well, last. I'm pretty sure it will. My brother is usually very good at what he does, so I'm sure he's underplaying his ability to weld. But anyway, this is the play for Ophelia. With all that in mind, I think I have a fairly good idea about how welding works, but it's theoretical knowledge and I might be wrong. And since this plug absolutely needs to both stay stuck and be watertight, I won't be doing the welding this time. My brother will be doing the welding. I can clearly recommend having an engineer at your disposal for stuff like this. 
It has, however, been a while since he last welded, and since we're also using a new and unfamiliar welding machine, he started out by just getting a handle on the device by putting down a few beads on this piece of steel we cut the plug from. And this right here is why I was advised by the shipyard to do as much work as possible with the boat in the water. In order to weld, we of course needed the welding machine. So, we have the grinder, hammer, cables, and the mask, and the rest of the cables and the electrodes, all of which had to be carried up that ladder. Due to that annoying thing called gravity, the plug needs to be held in Whoa. place by hand until the first tacks are in place. Seeing that the steel is a fairly good conductor of heat and that I'm, well, kind of sensitive about having my hands burned, I decided to hold it in place with a piece of scrap wood during the tacking. Communication through a boat hole is hard, especially when you're closing up the only hole there is. But after what felt like an eternity, we got the first weld in place. Oh. After another smallish wait, we, much to my surprise, got the other weld started. And that, right there is exactly why I needed that piece of scrap wood. And with those two tacks in place, it was time to get the plug welded in place for real. In order to make absolutely sure that the plug was thoroughly bonded with a hole and that there were no porosities that could let through water, there was a lot of welding, hammering, grinding and welding. The biggest problem was the underside of the plug, which was both hard to access and where the molten welding electrode had a tendency to run away from where it was needed. All the slack generated by the flux of the electrodes is of course a big problem with electrode welding, as it needs to be removed frequently. Tick welding probably would have been better for this job, but sometimes you just have to play the hand you've been dealt, or dealt yourself by learning by doing, as is the case here. Slowly but surely, the gaps around the plug closed millimeter by millimeter, securing the steel plug in place permanently. Well, at least I hope it's permanent. Replacing this isn't going to be any easier than getting it fitted in the first place. Welding and hammering. It seems like fairly simple work, but if there was even the slightest suspicion that a part of a weld had any voids or inclusions of slag, we would grind down that weld to be sure that it was metal all the way through. Better safe than sorry, after all. In the end, though, we got the plug to a place where even the engineer was confident that it would hold. It might not be pretty, but it is strong. With that, it was time to do the outside weld to finish the job. All the heat from the welding on the inside of the boat had caused the steel on the outside to oxidize. So, of course, that had to be removed before any welding could take place. I'm just thankful that we had electric tools for these parts of the job. Doing this manually would truly suck.
Then it was time to start welding again, and even though my brother had dreaded working on the floating hull, the top side of the truck went rather easy. The underside of that truck though, now that was another matter. Working under a sloping hull with molten steel which is trying its best to run away and drip onto you, that is the exact fun. You might also notice that the most brother has done my cap here. Getting one of those heavy sparks on your scalp, well that might just ruin your day as well as your haircut. All in all though, the outside went a lot smoother than the inside, as well it should. The seam that needed to be put in place on the outside was a lot smaller than the one on the inside. And with a coat of paint, in order to protect the new steel until Ophelia is properly sandblasted and painted, the job of closing the 220 liters a minute hole in Ophelia's hull was done. Thank you for tagging along. I hope you'll join me again next time where we do a couple of other quite important tasks before we put Ophelia back where she belongs. Please leave a like if I didn't bore you to death. It helps the channel quite a bit. Thank you.